Hey everyone, welcome to a video on multiplying fractions. Throughout this video, I'll be doing some different examples where I'm multiplying improper fractions, proper fractions, whole numbers, and mixed numbers. Once you get the hang of it, I'll be going over how to cross cancel or simplify before multiplying, and then go into showing you some models as well. Towards the end, I'll go over some application word problems and some extension problems as well. Let's get into it. In example one, I'm gonna go over how to multiply proper fractions and improper fractions. In this first example, we have 5 sixths multiplied by 4 sevenths. While we need common denominators while we're adding and subtracting fractions, we don't need common denominators when we're multiplying or dividing fractions. The most straightforward method to first start multiplying fractions is just to multiply the numerators together and multiply the denominators together. When multiplying 5 times 4 in the numerator, we get 20. We multiply 6 times 7 in the denominator to get 42. Just like when multiplying whole numbers, 5 6 here and 4 7s are going to be called factors. 20 over 42 will represent our product. Now that we have a product, we have to ask ourselves, can we simplify this fraction? And when we ask ourselves that question whether we can simplify or not, we have to check their greatest common factor, or their GCF. If the GCF between 20 and 42 is equal to 1, then we can't simplify. If it's anything else, we can. We're basically checking to see if these numbers are relatively prime or not. Let's find the GCF for 20, 40 seconds by using the latter method. Since they're both even numbers, we know we can divide them both by 2. In doing so, we're going to get 10 over 21. Since 10 and 21 are relatively prime, 2 is the greatest common factor. When we divide the numerator and denominator here by 2, we get the most simplified product for our multiplication problem of 10 21sts. Let's try another one together. In this next example, we'll multiply 8 ninths by 12 6. We'll rewrite this multiplication problem by writing 8 times 12 in the numerator, and 9 times 6 in the denominator. Multiplying 8 times 12 in the numerator, we're going to get 96, and multiplying 9 times 6 in the denominator is going to get us 54. 96 and 54 definitely aren't relatively prime because they're both even numbers. Let's find their GCF so we can simplify it fully. I'm going to start by putting a 2 on the side because they're both even numbers. 2 goes into 96 48 times, and 2 goes into 54 27 times. Using our divisibility rule for 3, I know that 48 and 27 are both divisible by 3. I added up their digits, 4 plus 8 is 12, and 2 plus 7 is 9. Putting a 3 on the outside here, we're going to get 16, and we're going to get 9. We can see our GCF is going to be 6, so we know we can divide both numbers by it. Once we simplify, our final fraction is going to be 16 ninths. While this is your product as an improper fraction, you could also rewrite it as a mixed number as 1 and 7 ninths. There's our answer. Let's try one more of these types. We have 15 tenths multiplied by 5 twentieths. Rewriting as one fraction, we're going to get 15 times 5 over 10 times 20. 15 times 5 is going to be 75 on top, and 10 times 20 is going to be 200 on bottom. These numbers are definitely not relatively prime, so I'm going to use the latter method to find their greatest common factor. Since they both end in 5 and 0, we know we can divide it by 5, but since I know my multiples of 25, I know 25 fits into 75 3 times, and 25 goes into 200 8 times. Thinking about 25 and 200 as money, I know 25 cents goes into 200 cents or $2 8 times. Since 3 and 8 are relatively prime, we know 25 is our GCF. Let's divide our numerator and denominator by our GCF and we get a final answer of 3 eighths. In summary, we should first multiply the numerators, second, multiply the denominators, third, simplify by their GCF, and fourth, rewrite it in a specific form, whether it's an improper fraction or a mixed number. In this first example, we're gonna start off by multiplying two mixed numbers together. We have four and one sixth multiplied by three and three fifths. When multiplying mixed numbers, the first thing we need to do is convert them both to improper fractions. Multiplying 4 times 6, which we get 24, and adding 1 to get 25, 4 and 1 6 the same thing as 25 sixths. Now let's convert 3 and 3 fifths to an improper fraction. We're going to multiply 3 times 5, which is 15, and add the 3 on top, which gets 18. 3 and 3 fifths is equivalent to 18 fifths. Now we've converted our mixed numbers into improper fractions. 4 and 1 sixth is equivalent to 25 sixths, and 3 and 3 fifths is equivalent to 18 fifths. Now let's rewrite our multiplication problem with just one fraction bar. We have 25 times 12 over 6 times 5. Before the numbers get too big, I'm going to break 25 into 5 times 5, and I'm going to break 12 into 6 times 2. In the denominator, I'm going to leave 6 times 5 alone. I split up 25 into 5 times 5 and 12 into 6 times 2 specifically so that we could have matching factor pairs in the numerator and denominator. 
Because we have a six in the numerator and denominator, they will cancel each other out. Similarly, five over five is one whole and they cancel each other out as well. Multiplying five times two in the numerator, we get 10, while we have a denominator of one since there are no numbers left over. 10 over one can be simplified down to just 10 holes. Breaking down the numbers while they're a little bit smaller to begin with will save us some time later on from simplifying with large numbers. Our product in this example is just 10. Let's try another one here together. Here we have six multiplied by four and two ninths. First, we'll write our whole number six as six over one, and we'll convert our mixed number of four and two ninths into 38 ninths. Six is equivalent to six over one, and four and two ninths is equivalent to 38 ninths. Rewriting this as one fraction, we're gonna get six times 38 over one times nine. Six and nine have a common factor of three. Let's break down these numbers a little bit. Six is the same thing as three times two, and we'll leave 38 alone and we can break down nine as three times three. Seeing as the numerator and denominator both have a three, we can cancel them out because they make a whole. Since all the factors in the top and bottom are relatively prime, we can multiply two times 38 to get 76, and we can multiply one times three to get three. 76 thirds is our improper fraction version, or we could do some long division to figure out what it is as a mixed number. Three goes into seven two times, two times three is six, with one left over, bring down the six, and three goes into 16 five times. Five times three is 15, and 16 minus 15 is one. Here we can see that 76 thirds is equivalent to 25 and one third. And there's our product. And let's try one more of these. We'll take five and four thirteenths and multiply by six and one half. We can convert five and four thirteenths into 69 thirteenths, and we can convert six and one half into 13 halves. And let's try one more together. Feel free to pause the video to try it on your own and check it with me when you're ready. Here we have five and four thirteenths, multiplied by six and one half. Rewriting as one fraction, we're gonna have 69 times 13 over 13 times two. While we could multiply 69 times 13 and 13 times two, we notice the top and bottom have a common factor of 13. Dividing the top and bottom both by 13, we actually don't have to multiply by 13. The numerator we're just left with 69 and the denominator we're left with two. After doing some long division, you can figure out that 69 halves or 69 divided by two is gonna be 34 and one half. While 69 halves is a valid answer, we could convert this into a mixed number by using long division. When doing so, you should get 34 and 1 half. While the process for multiplying fractions is still the same, there's one added step we have to do in the beginning here. I guess we could call this a step zero, where we have to first convert everything to an improper fraction. In example three, I'm gonna introduce cross-canceling to you, which is going to speed up the process a little bit more. In this first example, I'm gonna rewrite the problem as one fraction from the start. We have 14 times 28 over 21 times two. I'll go over a very thorough example first, and then I'll speed it up in the next two examples. Finding the prime factorization of 14, we get seven times two. Finding the prime factorization for 28, we're gonna get two times two times seven. The prime factorization for 21 is gonna be three times seven, and two is already prime. Again, 14 is equivalent to seven times two, 28 is equivalent to two times two times seven, and 21 is equivalent to three times seven. Instead of multiplying all of these numbers together and simplifying later, we can cross out all of the common prime factors right from the start. Dividing the top and bottom both by seven, the sevens will cancel out, and dividing the tops and bottoms by two will cancel out the twos. At this point, we can see that the numerator and denominator have no more common prime factors, making them relatively prime. We've essentially divided our top and bottom by the GCF, which is 14. In the numerator, we get two times two times seven, which just gets us 28 again, in our denominator, we just have a three. We can leave our answer as 28 thirds, or we can write it as a mixed number as nine and one third. However, instead of writing all this out, we could just simplify our fractions from the very beginning. If you can notice that 14 and 21 have a common factor of seven, you can divide them by seven right away. Dividing 14 by seven is gonna get us two, and dividing 21 by seven is gonna get us three. While we can simplify top and bottom, we can also simplify diagonally, or cross. Two and two have a common factor of two, so we can divide them both by two to get one and one. Notice here if we multiply one and 28 together, we get 28. And if we multiply three and one together in the denominator, we get three. Cross canceling can save you a lot of time when multiplying fractions. In this next one, I'm going to rewrite this problem using one fraction bar and write 15 times 24 over 18 times 45. Right from the beginning, I noticed that 15 and 45 are both divisible by five. However, if I think a little bit harder, I also realize that they're divisible by 15. If we divide 15 by 15 and 45 by 15, we can cross cancel them to make one third. And that makes sense because if you had 15 out of 45 of something, that's equivalent to one third. In looking at 18 and 24, we can notice that they have a common factor of one, a common factor of two, common factor of three, and a common factor of six. Since six is their GCF, we can divide them both by six. 24 divided by six is going to be four, and 18 divided by six is going to be three. 
Now that our numerator and denominator are relatively prime, we can multiply 1 times 4 on top to get 4, and multiply 3 times 3 on bottom to get 9. And just like that, we have our product. And let's try this one more time. In this next one, we have 2 and 8 twelfths multiplied by 15 sixteenths. 2 times 12 is 24, plus 8 is 32. And put that over 12, multiplied by 15 sixteenths. Notice how 32 is just double 16. If that's the case, we can divide them both by 16 to get 2 over 1. Cross-canceling here, we get 2 and 1. Looking at this 12 and 15, I notice they're both divisible by 3. 15 divided by 3 is going to be 5, and 12 divided by 3 is going to be 4. What's great about this method is that you can keep simplifying as long as you see common factors. Seeing this 2 and 4, we know we can divide them both by 2 to get 1 half. Cross-canceling here, we're going to get 1 over 2. The only numbers left in the numerator are 1 and 5, so 1 times 5 is 5, while in the denominator we have 2 times 1, which is 2. As a mixed number, 5 halves is the same thing as 2 and 1 half. The biggest takeaway is to keep looking for common factors until the top and bottom are relatively prime. Two advantages of catching all the common factors before you multiply is number one, you won't have to multiply large numbers as often, and number two, you'll have a lot less simplifying to do at the end, if any at all. In example four, I'm going to show you how to create a fraction multiplication area model. Right off the bat, 3 fourths times 1 half is really just 3 eighths. Let me show you how to represent that visually. First, we draw a rectangle. Then, we split it into fourths. Here we have 1 fourth, 2 fourths, 3 fourths, and 4 fourths. This entire rectangle represents one whole. Since our fraction is 3 fourths, we're going to shade in 1 fourth, 2 fourths, and 3 fourths. However, since we're multiplying it by a half, we need to split this whole thing in half. So we have one half and two halves, which also represents the whole. If we take half of this entire rectangle, we can shade it in just like this. Notice the area here that got shaded twice. While there are eight of these smaller rectangles, three of them got shaded twice. This is a useful visual model to help you understand why 3 fourths times 1 half is 3 eighths. If you're going to take half of 3 fourths, it's got to get smaller. Half of 3 fourths is 3 eighths. Similarly, if you were to take 3 fourths of 1 half, you wouldn't have an entire half, so 3 fourths of 1 half is just 3 eighths. If it makes more sense to you, you can think of it as 3 fourths times 1 half as really representing 3 fourths of 1 half. In math, of means multiplication. If this part of the fraction represents 1 half, and we split it into fourths to get 1 fourth, 2 fourths, and 3 fourths, this 3 fourths really represents 3 eighths out of the entire initial whole. In example 5, let's try some application word problems. Looks like Emma's making waffles for her math class. According to a recipe, each batch of mix makes 12 waffles. She makes 2.5 batches for her class. If each batch needs 5 sixths of a cup of milk, how much total milk will she need? First, I've highlighted some important information that's in the problem. Next, I'm going to set up a verbal model to represent this problem. Multiplying the number of batches by how much milk we need for each batch will give us the total number of cups of milk needed. While the problem tells us that each batch makes 12 waffles, that number's insignificant. Don't let that number distract you in actually solving for how much milk we need. We know that Emma's making two and a half batches and that she needs five sixths of a cup of milk for each one. Multiplying these two fractions together will get us how much milk she needs for all of the waffles. I'm gonna allow x to represent our unknown. When multiplying these fractions, we first have to convert two and a half into an improper fraction of five halves. We multiply five halves by five sixths. As one fraction, we can write five times five over 2 times 6. 5 times 5 is going to be 25, and 2 times 6 is going to be 12. Since we can't cross cancel, we're just going to multiply the numerators together to get 25, and the denominators to get 12. As a mixed number, 25 twelfths is going to be 2 and 1 twelfths. Emma will need 2 and 1 twelfths cups of milk to make all of these waffles. Let's try one more application word problem together. Here, Rio has a rectangular table that is 5 and 1 half feet wide and 3 and 2 thirds feet long. Draw and label a diagram and determine the area of the table. I drew a rectangle to represent this table and it's not drawn to scale. I'm going to label the width of 5 and 1 half feet and label the width of 3 and 2 thirds feet. We're going to be solving for the area or the inside of this rectangle to determine how much space is inside of it. Remember, 5 and 1 half represents the length, while 3 and 2 thirds represents the width. The formula for the area of rectangles is always just length times width. Using variables, we can say capital A is equal to lowercase l times lowercase w. If you don't see a symbol between the l and w, it implies multiplication. Since we know the length is 5 and a half feet, we can substitute that value in as 5 and a half feet, and we're going to multiply that by the width, 
which is 3 and 2 thirds feet. Converting these to improper fractions, we're going to get 11 halves feet multiplied by 11 thirds feet. Written as one fraction, this is going to be represented by 11 times 11 over 2 times 3, and it's going to be feet squared, since feet times feet is feet squared. Since we can't cross cancel, 11 times 11 is going to be 121, and 2 times 3 is going to be 6. The equivalent here is going to be 20 and 1 sixth feet squared. In summary, the area of this table is going to be 20 and 1 sixth feet squared. In example 6, I'm going to show you how to multiply rational variable expressions. To begin, I'm going to rewrite the original problem with one fraction bar. So we have 24 times x squared times 40 times y to the fifth power. In the denominator, we're going to have 30 times in the denominator, we're going to have 30 times y squared times 36 times x cubed. Since multiplication is commutative, meaning you can multiply in any order, I'm going to write the numbers first and the variable second. Just like we can cross cancel with normal numbers, we can cross cancel with variable expressions as well. First, I notice that 24 and 36 are both multiples of 12, so I can divide them both by 12 to get 2 and 3. At this point, all the coefficients, or numbers in front of the variables on the numerator and denominator, are relatively prime. Moving on to the x's here, I notice they both have x squared. Dividing them both by the x squared, we get 1 on top, and we still left with an x on bottom. Looking at the y's, we notice they both have y times y, so we can divide them both by y squared, we get 1 on bottom, and we get y to the third on top. Multiplying everything we have left in the numerator, we're going to get 8y cubed in the numerator, and multiplying everything in the denominator, we're going to get 9x. This would be the most simplified product. Let's try one last one here. I'm gonna rearrange the top to write 21 times 42 times a to the fifth times a to the eighth times b to the seventh power. Now that we've organized the top, I'm gonna to organize the bottom to get 54 times 14 times b to the third power, times b to the fourth power. We can combine a to the fifth power times a to the eighth power as a to the thirteenth power. And we're gonna leave b to the seventh power alone. In the denominator, we're gonna leave 54 times 14 alone for now, but we can combine b to the third power times b to the fourth power as b to the seventh power. Notice 21 and 14 are both divisible by seven, so we can get three over two. Looking at 42 and 54, we can divide them both by six to get nine and seven. With the three and nine, we can divide them both by three to get one and three. Finally, since they both have b to the seventh power, we can divide them both by b to the seventh and get one and one. Multiplying everything we have left in the numerator, we're going to get seven a to the thirteenth power, and in denominator, we're just going to be left with six. Seven a to the thirteenth power over six is our final answer. I hope you found this lesson useful in understanding how to multiply fractions better. Keep up the good work, and I'll see you in the next one.